Welcome to What If So What, the podcast where we ask what's possible with digital and figure out how to make it real in your business. I'm Jim Hertzfeld. And I'm Kim Chopek. We're part of Proficient's digital strategy team, and today we'll ask what if, so what, and most importantly, now what? When is the last time you logged into your company's intranet or reached out to HR to ask a question about some simple procedure or process at your company? How did that go? Were you able to find what you were looking for quickly and easily? What about the last time you needed to solve a customer issue creatively? Did you have both the tools and level of empowerment to make it happen? According to Gallup, in 2021, only 36% of U.S. workers reported they were actively engaged in their workplace. Those who reported they were actively disengaged said, and I'm quoting here, it was due to miserable work experiences and being poorly managed. Is it any wonder the great resignation continues to trend in news feeds? Today, we talk to Chris Eckelmeyer, a senior director in the Microsoft Employee Experience Practice, where he focuses on driving culture change at the employee and the organization level, and who has a unique perspective on what employee experience is, is not, and why it's becoming the top priority for business leaders today. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me here. Yeah, we're Employee experience is such a hot topic today. We're excited to have you on and hear your perspective from the trenches. And that's kind of my first question. Employee experience is becoming the buzzword of today. But how do you think about it? What is it and what is it not? Yeah, it's a, that's a really great question. And it is funny how it's hard to say what is it not, right? Because almost everything that we have been working with over the last 10 years is all of a sudden an employee experience platform or provider, or like you said, it's becoming the new buzzword. And when I say what it is not, it's easy to say, sometimes it's it's not another portal, right? It's not an HR tool or a new HR tool. It's not all of that. It, it's really everything that we have been working with. Yeah, it's all related to employee experience. The challenge is the reason employee experience has been so jumbled over the last several years is because there's a tool for everything and and you got to go somewhere to do everything. And it just becomes difficult to get stuff done. And then you compound that with the amount of meetings we're in and then you compound it with the pandemic. And I think that's why everything is accelerated into employee experience as sort of the big direction that we're heading as far as at Microsoft and, and modern work, employee experience is a, is a big, big area now that we're investing in. Yeah, you're so right. I think the pandemic has just been a catalyst for, if we're being frank, some unhappiness in how we get our work done every day and some frustration. But what's the number one thing you hear from employees about what they need from a modern employee experience? Like, what does modern mean to them? What are their pain points? And what are you hearing when you talk to them? You know, the first thing that I hear is make it about me. Don't make it about technology, like people before technology, right? Technology is the enabler for a better employee experience. It can bring it together, but we don't need another site, right? You don't need another portal. I don't need to go to the HR tool every day to do something. And we just don't, right? And so the the thing is, like, I go to several places, like we all do, every day to do work. So for a lot of this, that's, that's like teams, you know, we're always in email. Don't overload me with a bunch more emails taking me out of somewhere into another system. Like bring the employee experience stuff that matters to where I am and focus it on me. I don't want to have to go dig for it. That's the biggest thing I think we're, we're hearing is you know, a lot of big companies are essentially big bureaucracies because it's so hard to get stuff done. So make it easy to get stuff done and and make it personalized. I think that's great. And we're, we're hearing some very similar things from the employee experience engagements we're involved in. Certainly the make it easy for me or don't make it hard for me to be an employee. And hearing a lot more, like you're saying about, well, how can you give me additional previously, I guess they'd be called job aids, but tools collaboration platforms, like help me help you deliver on, you know, what we're saying is our brand promise, right? Yeah. And I mean, even something as simple as like internal communications, right? At our organizations, we all get internal comms from the internal comms team. 
you know, something we've learned and we all see this is like, I want to hear sometimes from my peers, how those come, you know, how that new initiative or new thing, like, I want to hear from my successful peers, what they think about it. I want to maybe hear comes from like my leader about how they interpret it. And that's where, again, we're getting some of that personalization, like bring it to me and make it matter for me. If you think about the outside world, you know, everything is personalized for us. And I think that's a big thing that we're starting to see, but it's just make it easy because we have so much demands on our time today. And like you said earlier, I use the word exacerbated. The pandemic and this whole work from home and then now hybrid, and hopefully now everyone's talking about flexible work, it has exacerbated a lot of issues that exist in companies today. So issues like inclusion issues and issues like slow decision-making, or we remake decisions after we make them, they've all become kind of exacerbated with remote work. And so you know that's the kind of stuff that makes employee experience poor. Help me do things better and faster. And, and we're seeing a lot of that when we go in and talk with customers. Yeah. You make a great point because we are seeing a lot of the same things and some of that push and pull between what employees are looking for and what leadership is on the hook for delivering as far as, you know, okay, if I'm the employee, give me more personalization. And if I'm a leader, I'm saying, I want to give you that personalization, but you also have to hear about this information. So how do leaders balance those needs and how do they take those needs and connect them to the organizational mission and vision? Yeah, that's a really biggie. And it's it's interesting. I'm going to back up for a second. So I've spent eight, 10 years working with customers on, on culture issues. And so when you think about a company going through culture change, it is usually a top-down thing. We're going to change the way we work. We're going to maybe become more inclusive. We're going to maybe like Microsoft growth mindset. How do you connect that down to employees and make employees sort of experience that culture work? It's really similar. I think now we're seeing that with employee experience where um, I take something, something as, like I mentioned, the comm story, I want to hear about it, not just from corporate, but from my peers. What we're seeing now also is employees, you know, one of the reasons we hear about this great resignation and people, 41% of employees saying they want to leave their jobs um, sometime this year and get a new job. A big part of that is employees don't feel connected to the organizational mission. They're disconnected and then the pandemic exacerbated it. So one of the things that we're starting to see is you might have seen an acquisition that Microsoft made back in October, a company called Ally.io in this OKR space. And that's one of these attempts is to connect you with the stuff that you're doing every day and the metrics and the objectives that you're working on every day, connect those up to the organizational goals. And that's one way to, to really give you line of sight and give leadership line of sight down into that that I think we're seeing, we're seeing a lot of interest in that now. It's, it's pretty amazing for a two-ish-year-old product to have this much sort of traction because it can align folks, at least with the bigger picture and make you understand like, how the work you do, it's got purpose, right? But that's the big thing. We're seeing people leave because they don't agree with the company's purpose. And that's a hard thing. You have to change the purpose or you have to have to understand that. But if you just don't feel connected to the purpose, that's a thing you can fix. Keyword purpose. I think that is what we're seeing too. And a lot of the anecdotal feedback, not only like you're saying, maybe a decision to stay or leave, but purpose in my everyday work. You know, why should I care more <laughs> about what I do? How is it connected? You know, when we think about it, how does EX feed CX? How do we make sure that I'm seeing purpose in delivering that same customer experience that you market, you know, out there to the world? So I'm with you on that. And I know you brought up technology as an enabler before, but, you know, traditionally employee related processes and systems were, were generally owned by HR or IT or both or many. How has that ownership and governance changed with the advent of employee experience as a big push? Yeah, it's a really interesting point to dig into. If you take something like a learning management system, let's just say, that would be traditionally owned by learning org, or L&D org inside of probably an HR org, 
they were never really designed to be super employee friendly or, or user friendly from the beginning. The, the core design was to ensure people can take training and you can audit that training. Like an auditor can come in and say, yep, everybody took the safety training. Everybody took the anti-corruption training and the compliance and security training. So checkbox. And that was the goal. And then, oh, yeah, we need to make it a little bit easier to use. And so I think what we're seeing is now like that example um, where I had to go six clicks in from a link that I got over email saying, take this class. We're seeing now, like, can we just bring it inside of Teams where I already am and just take it there and uh, just give me a single pane of glass to do it. So in that kind of example, it's still owned by the learning org. But now you have uh, traditionally the IT org who's going to own all the collaboration tools. They now are starting to own some of the execution of the employee experience world now, right? So they're they're on on the hook kind of to make this a better environment to be in. And and the you know that LMS is just one of dozens of tools you might use as a person at a big company. Just think about the, the HR tools alone that you might have to go to. They're probably all disparate systems. So checking your pay stub, or requesting time off, you know, all of the things that you might do in a, in a given several months, they're all individual little tools out there that are all have a disjointed experience. And so one of the things that the tech org can do now is say, we can take little bits of these and bring them right into the environment you're in. So rather than having to go to the place you get your pay stub, I just go to Teams and I do one click to the portal and I have a dashboard and I, my, the link to my pay stub is right there. And I can just click it and it pops up. That is a really cool employee experience that the IT organization can build and just connect back to that system. Yeah, so it sort of changes a little bit a mission and vision of maybe the IT organization. I know we were kind of joking before the call about, you know, the term internal customers, but Really, HR, IT, these departments within organizations were always internal service organizations. And maybe the employee experience push is allowing them to rethink their service model. What do you think? Yeah, and it's really interesting. We're starting to see embedded IT. We talked about how we first started to see embedded IT inside of HR, but we're seeing embedded IT in customer organizations, uh, sales organizations. We're seeing embedded IT in learning organizations even. I've, I've, I've had some big companies who have their own IT person there and they're no longer like servicing their customer. They're part of the business unit now. And I think that distributed IT model is interesting to see. Very, very interesting. And maybe our hypotheses here when we, when we work with our customers is good EX equals good CX. So I'm curious if you're if you are on board with that hypothesis, but also how do employee experience approaches differ today than in the past in service of that? Are companies leveraging CX capabilities and learnings to build a stronger EX, or are we not quite there yet in the maturity curve? Yeah, I, I would say sort of emphatically yes. Like it's really cool to see because there's been so much investment in a customer experience. And again, going back to the pandemic, overnight, some industries had to, well, a lot of industries had to change their customer experience literally overnight. So when I work in the healthcare space, healthcare providers and uh, insurance companies had to change that CX sort of experience overnight um, in offering sort of, you know, virtual doctor visits and making it much easier to handle insurance claims and things like that. Because at that insurance company, not everybody at the insurance company was at the call center, right? And doing it. And so everything is just... So they had to focus on a better customer experience in that respect. And I think the interesting thing is, we all know this, the chief marketing officer who owns that CX for the organization doesn't have to go budget for next year's FY23 budget to improve the customer experience. She got the budget right away to do that work overnight. But the employee experience side from IT and HR and learning, they have to budget a year away. And I think we're still seeing evidence of that a little bit. Like CX is influencing, yes, we have to do something about a better employee experience. The problem is I'm I'm still, I'm not seeing every company come forward and say, uh, yep, we're going to make budget for this right away. They're starting to plan ahead. But I'm seeing a lot of signs of it 
starting to change. And I think it's going to just continue to grow where the learnings from a customer experience are going to both in how you do it, what that means, how you budget for it as an organization, all of that I'm seeing evidence of it starting to really shift to be much more agile, enabling a better employee experience. That's good to hear and and agreed. There's probably a long way to go still. But, you know, our theory is good employee experience will actually help drive innovation and and customer experience. And, And you gave a good example with, you know, telehealth, but have you seen other examples of how employee experience improvements help drive innovation in the customer experience? Oh, yeah. Yeah. You know, just a simple one, right, is think about how busy we all are with the pandemic. That We've seen like sort of rise in lots of 30-minute meetings, but they tend to be bigger. How many 30-minute check-ins do you have compared to what you had two years ago? I, I think it's doubled for me because they've replaced like five-minute hallway conversations or 10-minute hallway conversations. When we work with companies and, and even internally here at Microsoft, when we work at trying to, to fix that, you know, the easiest thing is like, think about a four 30-minute breaks in your day where you've got two hours versus having a you know, one, two hour break in your day. Four 30 minute breaks is you're pretty much going to be checking email and probably a bar break and get coffee. A two hour break, I'm going to put my head down and think about things and solve problems. And I actually didn't book focus time prior to the pandemic. I didn't use it a whole lot. I just sort of, when I had free time, I would use that. So I think these tools that we have now to help you block focus time has helped me as a seller and and all of the Microsoft sellers really embrace it. And I'm seeing it at other customers where little things like that help us to be much more customer focused. So when we measure things like how much time are you spending as a, as a person with customers, we actually can see more time spent with them now and less time in some of the internal talking about the business versus doing the business stuff. So just simple things like, the habit of blocking focus time can make you more customer focused. If you're a frontline customer person who is stuck in meetings like a lot of us. So we're seeing a lot of things like that, like these learnings about how to work smarter, really help us to be much more customer focused. That's great. It it reminds me several years ago, this advent of no meetings Friday. And very quickly that fell apart. Well, I know it's no meetings Friday, but I'm just going to schedule this half hour with you. <laughs> and, and it sort of removed uh, the purpose there. But I love that point. It's like maybe because we are all working remotely for the most part, or a lot of us, I shouldn't say most of us, because we do have a lot of frontline workers who don't have that luxury still. But, you know, giving us that more focused time, I think, at home has been a blessing, let's say. Like you said, you're, we're seeing lots of different benefits. And I am curious, though, Chris, we haven't really talked about it too much, but what about these frontline workers? Are you seeing any innovations in how we're able to support them in service of the customer? Yeah. The biggest thing for frontline workers, like the biggest improvement that you can do as, a, as an employer is to get them connected somehow, right? Get them on teams, get them on you know, a device. I still talk with companies where the only way they can communicate to their frontline workers is like mail or posters in the break room. And you know that it just sounds so it's like crazy, but this is 2022, right? We have people that still do that. So get folks connected. So we've seen things like, you know, nurses are incredibly busy and they don't have lots of breaks and they don't have time to do things. But if you can connect them and, and connect them with other nurses just to chat and, and learn uh, best practices and share and empathize, you can actually drive a much better sort of employee well-being there just by connecting people and giving them a, a much easier vehicle to raise an issue or ask a question. And I cannot tell you how many orgs I, I run into who their frontline workers are, are really digitally disconnected. So that's the number one thing I see. You know, get them, get them a device, get them on Teams. It's really easy to do. And you've improved their employee experience so dramatically. It's, it's incredible. That's great. Thank you so much, Chris, for your time. I, I know I've learned a lot more about what you're hearing in the trenches and how we might be able to action on some of these learnings. Thank you so much for your time. And I'm sure we'll be talking again. 
I work with you all the time and uh, I will absolutely be talking with lots of your peers. I'll tell you that. Thanks so much, Chris. Take care. Now it's time for our namesake segment, What If, So What, and most importantly, Now What? As always with me is my co-host, Jim Hertzfeld, and also joining us today is special guest, Susan Wiener, a senior member of Proficient's Organizational Change Management Practice, who has spent over 20 years tackling some tough organizational topics, including employee experience. Jim and Susan, I'm curious to hear what you thought about Chris's perspective on the importance of employee experience today. Jim, why don't you get us started? Thanks, Kim. And um, hey, Susan, thanks for joining us. Really excited to have your perspective on this topic. Thank you, Kim and Jim, for inviting me. I'm delighted to be here. So I think Chris brought up so many things. This is such a topic, Kim, that we're seeing everywhere. Um, I'll just, I had, I was triggered by a lot of things in his perspective. It, it's so easy lately to talk about COVID and work COVID into so many aspects, you know, of our work or really anyone's work. But I think a lot of the the themes and the the outcomes that we're seeing that are driving reflection on employee experience or were happening long before COVID, I think, for a lot of reasons. And a couple of things that really responded to me that I liked, you know, the idea of no meeting Friday. First of all, I I, I forgot about <laughs> no no meeting Friday and it just doesn't happen anymore. It's, it's a like, myth. Yeah, it's a total myth. It's a long, it's a bygone era. You know, it just doesn't happen anymore. But I think we should have a meeting on that. <laughs> and the idea that, I mean, this is certainly, again, I don't think a COVID the only thing, but you know, we used to have five minute chats and now we have to schedule a 30 minute check in and we got to get caught up. And it's just the, I'm living in today. I'm in a back to back 30 minute meetings all day. So I think a lot of the, these small practices and, and rituals of the way we work and have meetings. And, and it's not just the office workers. We're going to talk a lot about frontline workers and however we categorize it. I think there's, there's a change in, in everybody's work day and, and work habits. And I, I certainly don't want to take an anti-technology stance here, but I think I'm going to blame technology. And I think technology has always had a way of creating unintended consequences. And Mm -hmm. so when when we talk about collaboration, it sounds great. Yeah, of course, I want to be able to collaborate. But being in 15 live chats while I'm also in a meeting is going a little too far, you know? (laughs) And I think that's just, it's, you know, it's over collaboration or it's novel, but is it really collaboration? You know, when I'm multitasking and I'm not really giving you the attention that I need, you know, and and it just creates this overload, this cognitive overload, this multitasking overload. I think of other use cases where I remember working with a brand that had a field sales force and they're out in their customer stores and they're stocking shelves and they're setting up displays. And, you know, it used to be you'd wheel a dolly in and put the product in and leave. Now they've got to rearrange the shelf space. They've got to take inventory. They've got a mobile app. It's creating all this overhead or this burden. It's just going beyond the job itself. And so I was thinking of a law that I like to bring up a lot. It's one of those uh, sort of tongue-in-cheek laws, but there's an old an old author named Jerry Purnell. He wrote this article. He used to write for Byte Magazine. And he created this article about the iron law of bureaucracy. And any organization that sort of devolves into two groups, there's the group that is devoted to the goals of the organization. That's, that's doing the work. You know, um, administering to the patient or making the pitch or writing the uh, the specifications. And then there's the second goal, which is dedicated to the organization itself. And that group always wins, you know? And so it's a little cynical, but if you kind of look back and you looked at how much time we're spending, let's say on skills training versus compliance training, you know, or the time that it takes to an effort to put into an expense report that a thousand people have to do every week, and have to go through extra steps to make the 10 accountants lives better. You know, so I didn't want to take a dark turn there, but I think it's this unintended consequence of technology. And I hope by the time we're done this with, with this, we find a way out. I hope we find a way where technology is actually doesn't get in its own way. So Susan, what did, uh, what was your take? What did you, what did you hear? Well, let me follow up on something you first said about the unintended consequences of technology and bringing it to the employee experience. My concern is around when there is that hybrid, people are in the room and people are on the screen, is how do we start to create an equal environment for both of them? You know, People on the screen may in fact be doing that multitasking you just mentioned and not paying attention to the same degree, or the people in the room may just be favored because their body language is stronger in 3D. But Thanks for asking about the takeaway. And yeah, I'm not going to bash the technology either. I think it's certainly important. Um, and Chris mentioned that uh, that technology, you know, meets employees where they are. 
and helps them to do their work in better ways. But I see the employee experience as largely about the space that employees are residing in. And the cultural space is there as well as the physical one. And so thinking about employee-centric cultures, um, what does that even mean? (laughs) And how do you create that so that that employee-centric culture lays the groundwork for that good customer experience. And one of my takeaways was when they were talking about CX as a, a shared responsibility. And that's certainly the case for employee experience, just like it takes a lot of coordination to provide that good customer experience. Employee experience is a shared responsibility, right? So it's everyone from leadership to the front line. You know, it's creating that culture because without it, uh, you can enable employee experience or you can really sabotage it. I think that's a great point. And I really like the distinction you're making, Susan, between the cultural space and the physical space because it kind of divorces the conversation from technology. Certainly, that's an enabler. But even thinking about the old people process technology paradigm, that's just a way to categorize and give a framework. But I think when you talk about culture and employee experience, they're just intrinsically and extrinsically linked. I thought the conversation with Chris was really interesting because employee experience is becoming such a hot topic. And, you know, we've been talking lately a lot about the basics of running the business and how basic can you get beyond providing employees the tools to do their jobs to service the customer. But I liked Chris's take that EX is not another portal. EX is not another HR tool. Similar, Jim, to what you're talking about, there's too many tools. There's too many meetings. There's external trends, pandemics, and lots of other things that challenge the employees to kind of really focus. It takes their focus away. And his point about, you know, what employees are really asking for right now, make it about me. Just like we're seeing in the customer space, make it about me, the customer. Employees are also saying, make it about me, you know, give me the tools that I need to do my job. And that really brings me to our what if. I found an interesting data point that said Chick-fil-A, a company that is reported to take a strategic approach to employee experience, earns double in per store sales than the biggest competitor there in their space, which, you know, Golden Arches. And they largely attribute that growth or that uh, sales performance to the chain being closed on Sunday. And if you follow that thread through, the employees feel like the corporation is really empathizing with them, empathizing with their desire to have one, you know, clear day off to spend with family, go hiking, do whatever they want. But, you know, they can be assured that they will not have to work on that day. And they have really said that gives them the space to provide excellent customer service and focus while at work which then results in greater customer loyalty. So I thought that was a really, really interesting data point um, that you can kind of extrapolate and, and think really big. So my what if is pretty big today. What if organizations actually took employee experience as seriously as they take customer experience? And I'm not talking about, you know, impacting metrics like employee retention or increased productivity. Even Chris was saying uh, these are not KPIs that (laughs) correlate with employee experience. I'm talking about like 10x top line growth based on paying attention to the employee experience. Jim, what would that take? That's an awesome correlation, by the way. I hadn't seen that or heard that before. When you're there, I mean, they're just, it it is efficient. They are friendly and pleasant to be around. But I think um, you know this correlation between CX and EX is really critical. When I think of the so what, you know, I think of answering questions of why brands, why leaders, and Susan, to your point, even why peers need to to focus on it. I think that's a great angle, by the way, that it is everyone's responsibility. It's not just senior leadership, or it's not just the manager's responsibility. It's kind of our our responsibility to each other. You know, I think there's a horizontal relationship as well. So I love that idea. But that correlation is, I guess we still need to make the case for that. And so when we talk about, so uh, I think there's some key why questions, you know, first of all, you know, I've already mentioned some some use cases. I just want to get my expenses done, or I just want to get out of this delivery, you know, so we want to make our employees more efficient. That would certainly make the job easier. And in turn, it's cost effective, you know, we become competitive, right? So if we can get you know, and this sounds a little 
maybe a little Machiavellian, but if I can get if I can get a 10x improvement in productivity, is that a 10 10x improvement in growth? Well, not at the expense of the employee experience. So we got to be effectively cost effective and then therefore competitive. Then well, why do we need well trained employees? Right. So if I can create an experience where people are able to do their best work, well, I have a return on just immediate return on customer satisfaction in terms of quality. My returns go down. My warranty claims go down. You know, that has a, a side effect on efficiency as well. But <clears throat> something we're all experiencing now, how do we get them to stay? And why would I do that? Well, it's expensive. It's, ex- it's hard to find talent. You know, you, it's expensive to bring them on board, to attract them. Certainly, there's an investment in training and then making them efficient. So we're starting to close the circle here. And then, well, why should they be happy? Well, so that they stay. So that they, you know, once we get them here, let's let's help make them efficient, get them well trained, help them become effective. They're going to be better at their job, but which is going to make them more effective and uh, in front of our customers. So whether that's the service or the product, you know, I think all those things add up to kind of closing the loop on delivering the customer experience that we want. Susan, what um, what does that mean? So if that's our our th- thesis here. We're connecting CX and EX. We kind of making a clear construction of why that's important. But what's the now? Well, what can we what can we do about it today? No more. I mean, your last question is, you know, why do we need happy employees? You know, how do, my question is, how do you know they're happy? Uh, you need to know that. Um, you know, I'm sure people have engaged employee engagement surveys, and and that's great, right? But that's not enough. You know, my question is now what? Make sure you've got formal mechanisms in place that actually reward people for speaking up, for taking risks, for challenging the status quo. I mean, that's where a part of the culture of innovation, of, of lack of fear, helps with engagement. You know, yeah, I say culture. I'll probably be coming back to that one uh, a bit. Kim, you know, I've been asking about what's that re- correlation between CX and EX. Now what? You know, when you're looking at your stakeholders, I do a lot of change enablement and we talk about stakeholders. I have been seeing a trend that I really love and, and, and would suggest that people follow, which is stop thinking of the stakeholders by their role and create actual personas for your employees because they are personas. And I think that will also help align the CX, EX mentality just the way the word internal customers started to come into play about 10 years ago. I thought an immediate and doable next step, again, about knowing more, know what people mean by employee experience. So when you say employee experience, like, are you even thinking it's the same thing as the person next to or across the screen from you today? I'd gather the odds aren't really high for that. My thinking is, you know, the next meeting you're in, Ask what everyone means by employee experience and and how would they recognize a good one when they see one and getting alignment on what EX is and what it isn't is a really critical foundational piece before you go any further in conversations. Because having people say the same word with different thought bubbles will not lead to a very productive um, progress. <laughs> right. <It's> great visual. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and um, I think the same thing holds true about the meaning and criticality of culture and the physical space in an employee's experience. What do we mean by culture? What do we mean by the impact of light or natural materials in our workspace? What do we mean by able to feel safe right now? So I think that's a bit of the now what. Chris mentioned something around ownership of the employee experience. And now what is to also get people together and be really clear about who owns what part of the experience? Because the reality is this is distributed ownership. Yeah, leadership might own, you know, championing the message or or funding a key initiative that HR owns in executing. Managers may need to own, you know, listen for what's getting in the way or what is working around the employee uh, experience. And the front line, you know, may need to own the responsibility for giving feedback on the reality. And of course, I'll use my favorite word again, they need a culture that gives them a safe space to do so. I love those now what's, Susan, I know. Sometimes it's really hard though. Like you're saying, I'll, I'll echo your culture sentiment. What does it mean to feel safe giving feedback? And what does it mean to be able to have this conversation around employee experience? In some cultures that 
tend to be political or, you know, it's it's tough. So I, I like those now what's because you can really start one on one, maybe even you don't have to talk to your boss tomorrow. You can talk to your colleague. You can talk to your, like you said, person across the screen and just have a candid conversation without making it a full blown, you know, meeting at this point. It just seems like you can start from from grassroots. Yeah. And it's really clarity on language, right? Because that's what we have. Are you meaning what I'm meaning? And what does that truly mean? So it doesn't become this buzzword that ends up going nowhere or that people feel good about creating this good employee experience when the fundamentals haven't even been agreed upon. <laughs> back back to the basics. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Ken. I like that. I just want to chime in. I like the pay, I'm called it the pay it forward kind of mentality. This is really fresh for me. Just the idea of the making it everyone's responsibility and not to sound too um, hokey or kumbaya here, but you know, what can you, you know, that's something I could do today. Like after this call, I can help somebody, you know, one of my peers maybe consider their job or how they're affecting or uh, a customer experience or a specific interaction. So I love that idea of sharing it. Yeah. Jim, you know, you were, you were talking about training and I, and I want to even expand on that because this is really about development. You know, you can be training on tools, but you're developing people's sensitivity and awareness and consciousness around this concept of employee experience. So when we think about development, you know, a, a now what is what are we doing to develop our people at all mm -hmm. levels to be able to make this real? That's great. Well, thank you so much, Susan, for joining us today. We've learned a lot from you and your experience and, and again, some great now what's. And thanks again, Jim, for your co-host duties today. Always. Thanks, everyone, for listening. Please visit your favorite podcast platform to rate and subscribe. And until next time, keep asking what if, so what, and most importantly, now what? You've been listening to What If, So What? the digital strategy podcast from Proficient with Jim Hertzfeld and Kim Chopek. We want to thank our Proficient colleague, J.D. Norman, for our music today. Subscribe to the podcast and don't miss a single episode. You can find this season along with show notes at Proficient.com. Thanks for listening.